but it's the the state that the remains were found in and some of the other things that were found uh, in conjunction with these remains that raise a lot of questions. Hey, what's going on guys? Mr. Ballin here. You probably know me from TikTok where I am known for telling scary stories and talking about unsolved mysteries and true crime. But if you are not coming from TikTok and I'm starting to see a trend that actually a lot of people are just finding me on YouTube, which is really cool. I was a Navy SEAL for a couple of years. I, I was actually medically retired in 2017. Um, and I started making content about my military experience, mostly on Instagram. And then I joined TikTok in the early part of this year. And at some point, I just wanted to try something new and, and wanted to try a different content style. So I posted about uh, an unsolved mystery, which is the Dyatlov Pass incident. It's about a bunch of hikers that disappeared in the mountains of uh, in Russia. And no one really knows why. And it takes off. And it's something that I just am really interested in. I think unsolved mysteries are fascinating. I find myself almost as a hobby researching this stuff. And it was cool to finally have a place where I could actually create content around unsolved mysteries and true crime and kind of scary stuff. Um, and TikTok was the place. But what I'm trying to do is transition over to YouTube where um, I can tell longer versions of these stories and get a little bit more in depth. And so I have committed to posting at least one of these types of videos on YouTube a week. And I hope that you will subscribe and you will follow along because right Right now, my YouTube skills are very low, uh, admittedly. Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at TikTok. I'm pretty bad at YouTube, but I'm going to get better. Uh, I would also love it if you guys have suggestions for videos that you, you pass on my way, either in the comments of the video, or you can shoot me a DM on Instagram. My handle is John B. Allen 416 so John Ball in 416 Shoot me a DM, and I'd love to hear your feedback. So today, we're going to talk about one of the more well-known uh, unsolved mysteries, and it is the very strange disappearance of two college students from the Netherlands who go to Panama and they had saved up all this money to go on this trip. Like they were working at a cafe for the six months leading up to this trip that they were going to finance mostly themselves. They had mapped out all these different places they're going to go in Panama. It was going to be like part vacation, part like mission trip where they were going to be helping out with different charities and the different villages they go to, but also enjoying the travel. Um, these girls were very close. They were highly intelligent. They were just wonderful, smart people. And they were really excited about this trip. And they, they go to Panama and the first couple weeks go without incident. And at some point, things take a very significant turn for the worst. And so let's dive in. On March 15th, 2014, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, who are both uh, Dutch college students, head to Panama for a six week long part vacation, part charitable giving trip. Um, they had mapped out these six weeks really diligently. They planned to do lots of traveling and exploring. And then also they were going to be working with different charities along the way as they went all over Panama. And they were really excited about it. They had even uh, worked for the six months leading up to this trip at a cafe to raise additional money for this trip. So March 15th, they arrive in Panama. The first two weeks they're there, go beautifully. They, they, they do some traveling, they're working with different charities and everything's going to plan. Um, and then by the second week they arrive in a, in a little town called Boquette and they stay at this hostel. So that's like a group living situation. It's pretty common amongst uh, travelers all over the world where to save money, you'll crash at these like uh, almost like dorms where other travelers and people will stay in the same room as you. Two weeks in, they're in Boquette and they're living in this hostel. So on April 1st, they're, they're in Boquette and they want to go on this fairly significant hike, uh, which is going to be around this massive volcano called the Baru Volcano. Up near, I guess, the, the summit of the volcano, uh, there was this amazing overlook where if you climbed up to it, you could get a, a beautiful 360 degree view of, of the entire area. Uh, Froon and Kremers decide they want to go they want to go hike up to that overlook. They were experienced hikers, but realistically, I don't think they were taking this hike particularly seriously. Uh, it was a hike that was traditionally a guided hike, uh, meaning usually you went and did this with a local who could make sure you didn't leave the path or you know fall where you didn't know there was a cliff or something. They opt to do this on their own. So they, they head out and they actually, they bring the, the hostel owner had a dog uh, and they decided to bring that dog along with them. It was a very friendly 
family dog. So Kramers, Froon, and the dog head off for this hike uh, up this volcano. They had a digital camera with them. Uh, in addition to you know water, and they had their phones, and all the different kind of basic supplies, they had a camera. Um, and so this is important because they take a bunch of pictures as they begin this journey. So that night, the dog returns to the, the hostel, but the girls are with the dog. And so this alerts the owners of the hostel, but they, they search the area like I guess the immediate area for the girls, they can't find them. And they decide, we'll just wait till the morning and see if they turn up. Um, the next morning, they, they don't turn up. Um, additionally, the parents of the girls, they were used to getting very regular text messages from these girls to kind of let them know that everything was okay. And the text messages stopped. Um, and so that alerted the parents as well by the second day after they've, they've gone missing. And so authorities are alerted. Search crews were organized uh, on foot for the first day. So April 2nd, there are search crews all over the place looking for these girls, can't find anything. The next day they set up aer aerial search teams. They're scouring the jungle looking for signs of these girls, no sign of them. The search continues and then in, on April 6th, the parents of Kremers and Froon, they arrive in Panama. They immediately offer a $30,000 reward for any information about their daughters, um, which is a ton of money in Panama. It's roughly equivalent to about a half a million dollars in a developed country. I mean, with 30,000 US dollars in Panama, I mean, you could buy land, you could buy a house, you could start a business. I mean, this is big money. Um, and considering many people, especially in that area, were, were day laborers that were working for like less than $10 a day. I mean, you would think that that type of reward for just information about uh, about these girls uh, would would incite hundreds of people just on their own go looking for these girls. And if you consider too that, I mean, this is a small town, I mean, people, news travels fast, you know, this is the area they probably grew up in, they know the area really well. Um, the idea that with, with, the, with an amazing incentive, the financial incentive, and just the fact that they know this area really, really well, um, it's it was odd that nothing was turning up. There were no leads coming in. Three months go by and there is not a sign of these girls anywhere. They have vanished. There's no leads. Nothing's been found. Uh, you know, obviously at this point, the family and investigators are at this point have pretty much accepted that they're, they're probably deceased at this point, but they're looking for them. They, they want to know what happened. And a local woman finds uh, Froon's backpack, her blue backpack, five miles away from where the girls were supposedly hiking or where they had intended to hike. Navigating a jungle is exceptionally difficult. Uh, even with the right equipment, even knowing what you're doing, the travel is so slow. Cutting through on a, the, the growth on the ground, there's animals to contend with, there's, uh, it, it, even though it's incredibly moist, uh, there's lots of moisture in a jungle. The water oftentimes can't be drank, so the risk of dehydration is really high. Uh, the jungle that they were in was incredibly mountainous, and so in addition to just navigating a jungle, you're dealing with pretty significant elevation changes. I mean, it is a treacherous place to be navigating, absolutely treacherous. And for them to have moved five miles through dense jungle is, it's incredible. Uh, th that is almost unbelievable. But nonetheless, their backpack is found, you know, five miles away. In addition, the woman who found the backpack, you know, she's a local woman and she said, you know, I I'm out in this area a fair amount and, and I I've not seen this backpack. I saw it today and I picked it up and reported it, but it just means that the backpack probably had not been sitting there for very long. It, it had been probably placed there within the past couple of days, let's say, which doesn't really provide that much clarity, but it, it adds to the kind of intrigue around what actually happened. So the backpack was in great condition and, and everything inside the backpack was very neatly kind of placed. Uh, it looked like someone 
had very intentionally placed everything in the bag, zipped it up neatly, and put it down by the riverside to be found. It didn't have the look and feel of a backpack belonging to two missing people in the, in the Panamanian jungle that's been missing for the past three months. It looked like it had just been grabbed off a shelf, put some stuff in it, and put down. But either way, inside there was, you know, there's sunglasses, there was a water bottle, there was um, some, some underwear that was in there, and their camera, their digital camera was in there, which is going to be really important. And both of their phones were in there, another really important part of this investigation. So when the initial search was conducted, it was done with a focus on the volcano area, because that's the last place the girls had been, at least as far as everybody understood. But now that they found this backpack five miles away, they had a new area to search. And so they do. They start searching around the area around the backpack, and they quickly find some of the girls' clothing neatly folded on the side of a river, but no sign of the girls. And then another two months go by, and they finally locate in the same rough area that the clothes and the backpack were found. They actually discover some of the remains of, of the girls that, that DNA confirms it was them. But it's the, the state that the remains were found in and some of the other things that were found uh, in conjunction with these remains that raise a lot of questions. So of the remains that were found, uh, DNA proved that some of them were Chris Kremers and Lee San Fruit. DNA also showed that mixed in with some of the bone fragments and, and pieces of remains that were found were at least three other people's remains. So we, we're talking about five people's remains in the same area. Also interestingly, uh, scientists were able to, to look at the bones and there were no scratches on the bones. So that's important if you think about it, you know, because their, their bones were found all over the place, they had been, you know, broken apart, right? Well, if an animal had been responsible, there would have been scratches all over the bones because they would have broken the bones that way. Without those scratches, the only other way it could happen is if they've basically been pulverized, basically broken with like blunt force. So obviously something horrible has happened to these two girls, but their remains, really only show investigators that the women had had died. It doesn't show how they died or really anything. And so investigators needed to look at the other evidence to try to get a better sense of what actually happened. And so they look at the phone records and they can tell that on April 1st, when they started this hike initially, there is a string of distress calls that are sent within like an hour of the hike starting. So whatever happened to these girls happened almost immediately on their hike. Um, none of those calls connect. Over the course of those first four days, uh, as they're trying to reach help via their cell phone, nothing's connecting and then Froon's phone dies. Kremer's phone does not and they begin, uh, they or she, begin turning it off and then turning it on sporadically to try to get reception. On April 6th, something interesting starts to happen. Somebody was trying to access Kremer's phone. Um, there was multiple failed login attempts um, and it, it got to the point where you weren't even allowed to input any more, more uh, codes. It was just like locked, the phone locked. So somebody was unable to get into the phone. From April 7th to April 10th, there were 77 calls attempted, distress calls attempted. Uh, and then on April 11th, the phone died and that was it. So in addition to the phone, uh, they started looking at the camera. And so when you look at all the pictures they took, the beginning of the camera roll is this wonderful, you know, montage of these two girls having this great time hiking up this volcano. Um, and then as night begins to fall, you can tell that their, their expressions begin to change a little bit. It looks like you could begin to see that maybe something was wrong, perhaps their boss, you don't really know. But then there's no more pictures taken until April 8th. 90 pictures, over 90 pictures are taken between April 8th and April 10th, which is that period of time where all those distress calls were made on Kremer's phone before Kremer's phone finally uh, died. The pictures are very strange. There's a lot of theories about why they took the pictures they did. 
But in a nutshell, it's a lot. It's the pictures. None of them include pictures of the girls, with the exception of one, which is the back of Kremer's head, and it appears to be bleeding. The rest are, are you know, shots of the landscape, and they're all taken in total darkness. So they're in the middle of the jungle in total darkness, taking these pictures. There was one picture that looked like.、Uh, Whatever gear they had had been kind of lined up on on a rock, and then someone had taken a picture of it.、Um, there were pictures of candy wrappers,、um, and there also was a picture that、uh, was like looking down into a ravine that perhaps was a picture of one of the girls down in the ravine. So it's unclear who's taking the pictures.、Uh, it could be the girls, could be one of the girls, could be a third party. We don't know. And then there's a ton of speculation about one picture in particular. So, picture five zero nine, as it's been dubbed, because that was the number on the camera roll, was deleted from the camera. Now, that in and of itself is not particularly strange. It's not crazy to think that these girls might have deleted a picture, right? I mean, maybe they accidentally snapshot something and they just deleted it. But it was permanently deleted, right? So, if you hit delete on a digital camera, it's deleted. But a professional with the right software could. Reconstruct that image if they plugged it into a computer. Now, in order to permanently remove it from your camera, the girls would have had to connect it to a laptop, to a computer, and wipe it that way. They didn't have access to a computer, so at most they might have hit delete, but it still would have had that kind of archived, almost ghost image that a professional investigator could have reconstructed. But when they went to do that with this deleted image, it was wiped for good. So someone had managed to professionally wipe one picture. It was the last picture on the camera roll. So the pervading theory here is that these girls got lost and fell to their death. But to me, that's totally unsatisfactory. I believe they were murdered, and I think it's because there's just too many things indicating that foul play was involved.、Uh, How did they go five miles across incredibly rugged terrain that, even amongst Navy SEALs, that would be a very difficult distance to cover, even with all the right equipment? How did they, without the right equipment, not knowing the area, without a guide, without even flashlights, how did they do that? And then, let's just assume they managed to go the five miles. Okay, they fall to their death. Why are their remains one incomplete and two scattered and mixed in with other people's remains? Why were Kremer's bones bleached, and why weren't there scratch marks on the bones? I mean, you would think that, in order for their, if they've fallen off this cliff, let's say, in order for their remains to be scattered all over the place、uh, and be dismembered, that an animal would have to be involved. If there's no foul play involved, and there's no scratch marks on the bones, so an animal couldn't have done it. So there's just there's lots of questions that go unanswered,、uh, and then if you look at those pictures again. Um, it seems an awful lot like somebody else was taking those pictures. Somebody was trying to access Kramer's phone towards the end there, and someone looks like they were using their camera as well. And then, you know, the, the backpack that was found—it just seems like it was kind of staged.、Um, but then again, like to what end? Why were they giving away the camera and the phone, which kind of led them to thinking probably this is foul play? Why would they have placed the backpack? That doesn't really exonerate anybody.、Uh, it actually just adds more. Uh, questions about the case, so the, the whole thing is just very confusing. But the narrative that they simply got lost and fell to me seems like the most far-fetched thing out of all the theories. So that's gonna do it, guys.、Uh, if you liked this, please like and subscribe. I'll be doing these at least once a week. I'd love it as well if you dropped in the comments suggestions for future videos.、Uh, and also, please, if you want to message me, hit me up on Instagram. My handle is John B Allen four one six. Also, please follow me on TikTok. That's Mr. Ballin on TikTok, and so that's gonna do it, guys. Let me know what you think happened in the comments. Thanks.